Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Newsflash. My name is Spencer Walsh. Hope you had a great Easter if you celebrated it all. And I, I do want to, you know, you know, Easter Sunday is when I'm doing this. I don't know if you're listening uh, on Easter Sunday, but there is, of course, a very interesting kind of topic permeating the left. And we are definitely a left wing show. So time and time again, we kind of do this thing, you know, with a strategy meeting of sorts where we go over some of the things, some of the main issues that are really dividing you know, major left-wing uh, forces. That's what we're going to be doing for a big part of today's show. The title of today's show is Has AOC Sold Out the Left and the Progressive Movement? It's a big claim to make, and we'll try to answer it. Also, on today's show, we're going to be talking a little bit about Derek Chauvin and cops in general. An analysis by the New York uh, Washington Post pretty much explains uh, why, when cops so clearly kill, why it is so hard to convict uh, and really nail them down on something substantive. So we're going to get into that, but um, there's a very interesting kind of um, debate, just broad debate that's been happening in, in, in general terms among the left wing uh, in terms of people who want to like see policies like Medicare for All, Green New Deal, uh, taxing the rich, uh, college for all, all these kind of like Bernie Sanders policies that we all know so much about. Uh, just the people who want to see, you know, a more equitable society where the working class is empowered um, and more and more people in this country can live with dignity. You know, like people fighting for working class politics. I mean, it's been rough since Bernie lost. There's been no denying about that. Whether you're a social Democrat or an anarchist, you felt the Bernie loss pretty heavily. And the big debate has been what path do you want to move now inside outside electoralism or direct action and there has been a big source of debate for that there's been people who have really wanted to go the way of electoralism that's with the you know the dsa elected candidates the members of the squad out there who are in congress uh, like aoc and one of the and uh, it's very interesting that this this debate has has gone back and forth we had a discussion about force the vote um in that kind of method of electoral politics. Personally, I kind of come down on, you know, you got to have an inside and outside strategy where you have, you know, sympathetic elected officials like members of the squad, but you also have to have forces outside the, to push and generally influence the electoral system. Otherwise, you're really not going to get a lot of stuff done like we, like we see now. So, yeah, pretty much the controversy here really restarted in, in this big debate, um, which is, it's all kind of about... Um, the the dynamic between dealing with some of what's happened on how, pretty much how the left deals with the Biden administration. And AOC was talking to DSA, uh, this the magazine, I think they have this little offshoot magazine called Democratic Left, and um, she was asked, some on the left have looked at Biden's record and his difference with the Bernie wing of the party, and they conclude that no progress is going to come out of the Biden administration. What's your view? And she says here, I, like this is a kind of a very like it's, it's a point of debate that I I really strongly strongly disagree with, and it's it's, it's she kind of carries this motive over very very similar. She re, she says, uh, well, I think it's a really privileged critique. Uh, we're gonna have to, and the question it's be interesting to see who she thinks and who she mostly sees that kind of critique is coming from, but. Uh, she says, we're going to have to focus on solidarity with one another, developing our senses for good faith critique and bad faith critique, because bad faith critique can destroy everything we've built so swiftly. And in, that's the question. What has been built? What ha, what are the big changes that has been made? That is what a lot of people are, I think, asking more and more of AOC and members of the squad. Like, we got you in there. We put you in there. We like invest our hopes and dreams in, in people like AOC and Elon Omar, like, getting in there, holding Democrats accountable. They seem to be doing that a lot more in, you know, like 2017, uh, 2018. They, but they weren't even in office in 2018. Like 2018 uh, was, yeah, 2018 was when AOC first got elected. Yeah, so 2018 really <laughs> was uh, when she, 2018, 2019, there was a little bit of that, you know, controversy. Elon, Elon Omar doing a great work, kind of, I remember questioning um, uh, Elliot Abrams, um, you know, really m starting fires and, uh, you know, make it uh, really pushing in some way. And now, you know, after 2020, you think now they have a real shot to do some damage. Their numbers pretty much doubled and they could really get some stuff done in Congress, especially with the incredibly small majority that Nancy Pelosi secured herself in the House. Um, and that's what people are asking. You know, see, and I don't think that telling them it's their privilege for that is, is not 
is, is, is the right way to go. It's like that is talking about bad faith. Like a lot of the people who are making these critiques are people who would directly benefit from things like the minimum wage or Medicare for all or all these progressive priorities that AOC claims to support but has done very little to actually pressure and use her massive amounts of power in Congress to, to, to get people. Like there just has not been any effort or any sign of effort. Like it, even if there was a sign of effort, if there's a sign there's some like it's attempt being put in that would be even a little bit more you know doable but it's really just kind of rough um she doesn't have a lot to say about that uh she said because bad faith critique can again destroy everything that we built so swiftly and we know this because it has in the past and it's taken us so many decades to get to this point we do not have the time or luxury to entertain bad faith actors in our movement so I do wonder, yeah, like, who who's she thinking about? Is she thinking about, like, you know, Jimmy Dore or something in the back of her mind? I do not know. Uh, but she says, we also have to have value our solidarity with one another. For anyone that brings up, we really have to ask ourselves, what is the message that you're sending to your black and brown and undocumented members of your community, to your friends, when you say nothing has changed? Um, I really don't think those people are offended. You know, like, I don't get the, I don't get how it's such, it's such a grave insult to them to be like, yeah, well, we still need a lot more and Biden sucks. Like, if, um, and by the way, this is the thing. If we're talking about black and brown and undoc, specifically she mentioned here, black, brown, and undocumented members of the community, what has Biden done for, I guess it's more about like what Trump will not do, but as we'll get to this in my, my second exhibit, very little has changed in, on the policy fronts from Trump, at least as of yet, from Trump to Biden on, on issues uh, that affect uh, black, uh, brown, and undocumented members of various communities. And AOC is kind of covering for Biden on that. Or not kind of, but is. Um, perhaps not enough has changed, uh, and this is not a semantic argument, just the night, uh, I think it kind of is, and I don't think that many people are going to be offended because, oh, hey, you're not giving Biden enough credit, like, the people who get offended when you don't give enough, uh, when you don't give Biden enough credit for all the great things that he's done that should be, like, you know, treating these groups with basic amounts of, like, human dignity and respect, the only people who get mad about, at you for questioning that, and saying that, you know, there's more that needs to be done are not the people who are receiving the benefits, but the people who bestowed the benefits in the first place because of pressure from, you know, whatever force, like whatever kind of outside force that, you know, is pushing by and left to kind of do these, you know, uh, policy changes that I really am, I don't don't know. Um, yeah, just the other night, we in a collective struggle were able to stop the deportations of critical members of our community, and that would not have happened in a Trump administration. Yeah, so obviously, this you you got to be a hundred percent clear there. Like you know, obviously, it's better to have Trump, or sorry, better to, better to have Biden than Trump um, for immigration. But we talk about it's it's really the the gap is getting incredibly like small because yes, yeah, sure, you know, you may be able to get like a court or or Biden to come in and stop something, but. In a in a very like limited circumstance, but you still have the same policies, and they're not they chose no signs of changing. Like the the pictures of facilities on the border are exactly the same, and the worst part of it is now that so much credibility is being lost, and there is no effort to be seen in terms of actually changing the conditions on the ground, and a lot of obf obfuscation, a lot of like moral preening. Of all these people who made such a big deal out of, oh, there's kids in cages. We need to stop this right now. And then Biden gets in there, and we need to we need to give Biden credit because Trump he was really bad. Okay, like that like that is literally what it seems. So, um, yeah. So she goes on to say uh, they were just on the belt, ready to go, and you cannot say that nothing will change. And why does it matter? Like I do not get the the argument of like, okay, every good thing that has we. A thing that happens, we have to say, "Oh, thank you, Biden. Thank you, Biden. Like, please, please, please. We we are so forever grateful for you for just doing. You know, I don't know. I, it doesn't really reference the exact specific issue that she's talking about. But in terms of immigration policy, things have not been good. He didn't haven't really done anything yet for you know black or brown communities as a whole. But for immigration policy, there is no denying it has not been good. It has not been good." Um, and this was beforehand, obviously. This was a interview. I just want to make this 100% clear. This was an interview previously. But she, as we'll show you, she goes on. She, her position doesn't get any better when um, 
more of the details of Biden's immigration policy come out. So she says uh, we can make the argument that none, not enough is changing fast enough and we are really not nitpicking questions of semantics because this is how language that we use communicates to individuals who is included and who do you consider a person. When you say nothing has changed, you're calling the people who are not protected from deportation no one. And I I don't like, you know, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I just, have not read of any policies that are suddenly, you know, incredibly more like Biden's protecting way more people from deportation. Um, and uh, granted this was, yeah, obviously this was prior. This was like a few months ago. Um, this was prior to, you know, this is, or sorry, this is March 19th. This was before all the news about Biden's immigration policy came out. But, um, you know, and I mean, I really do kind of struggle to see how she talks about, you know, when you say nothing has changed, you are calling the people who are now protected from deportation no one, you know, and it really is like in in grand proportion of the putting it in proper perspective of the the um, actions that Biden's taking. It could very well may as may as well be no one is being substantively better protected from deportation. I think it's very, very important to like take a look at and put in the proper context what Biden is doing here because then that just creates a culture of, you know, homerism, not challenging um the the leader of the Democratic Party when he makes a mistake and that just leads to further disillusionment, further lack of trust, and the idea that nothing like the idea that is already so incredibly strong um and incredibly powerful and well supported among the populace is that no matter who I elect, nothing's going to fundamentally change. And that is a very, very dangerous attitude. So like, this is another great example of it. This is from, um, I believe just, a, just a few days ago in reference to, uh, some of the things that Biden has been doing about immigration policy, uh, talking about what has been happening on the border. So yeah, it's just very, very strange. And we'll, 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 I will pause it from time to time and break down this clip. Now, the first thing I want to say is that the fact that this keeps happening over and over and over again is a political failure by both parties. And I want to be very clear about that because I don't want to draw false equivalents. What is happening here is not the same as what happened during the Trump administration, where they took babies out of the arms of their mothers. Yeah, and like that's the whole ridiculous part of it. Like the dramatization in terms. The when Trump did it, it was they were t- ripping babies from the arms of their mothers. But when Biden does it, it's like it's it's not the same. And it's as she goes on to say later in this, it's an affront to justice to even suggest that the things are the same. Like when in actuality the policies have not changed. Biden is still separating kids from their families. It, maybe it's not, you know, little babies 100% of the time, but kids are still being taken away or, and, and put in these facilities who are very, like, and um, were very, very crowded, not any sort of, like, they're being detained. They're being put in prison for trying to come across the border here. And that is a policy that certainly has not changed. They're being kept in these areas for, you know, like way, way longer than they should have and being traumatized. And sure, you know, it's run a little bit more competently than the Trump administration, where they're just, you know, like shooting them back out, not writing any records down of when they actually came. Um, But it really seems that the like just all you have to do really is you've got to look like the pictures and the conditions of what's actually going on there it's literally the same it's and it's it's a very very hard case to make if you're see coming out there and say there, this is a offensive and dangerous thing to do to say there's any kind of false equivalence to trump and biden's immigration policy when you have these pictures out there they're the same i i wonder how people especially people who know immigrants or immigrants themselves who maybe they have a family member coming over right now who's dealing with a lot of you know uh dealing with the the hell that is the legal immigration system or the yeah the 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 minefield that is our immigration system um, and really having a tough time with it. And it, it would make complete sense if you see someone like AOC, who you probably admire as someone who has been very upfront in fighting for immigration rights and challenging the, the horribleness of the Trump uh, regime on borders, 
And you see Biden come out there. You see all these same pictures. You see the trouble that your your family members having, and then you see AOC come out there and say, "Oh, there's no there's no real big difference here. The, the, or, there's a big difference here. We can't make a false equivalency. We can't make a false equivalency between what Trump is doing and Biden's doing." And you see the same thing happening for yourself. And AOC is saying it that everything's fine. It's enough to make you really go insane. And that is the effect that this kind of stuff has on people. And deported their families and permanently traumatized these children, some of whom we don't know will ever be reunified with their family again, which is a level of human rights violation that is just simply not the same. Both of these things are barbaric and they're wrong. But when you rip a baby out of the hands of a mother, you cannot draw the same comparison. And anyone who is trying to do that is doing a profound disservice to the cause of justice. Yeah, I mean, I've looked, I've looked, I've tried to understand what she's saying here. How is the difference? Migrant children at the border are still being separated from relatives for weeks under this administration. For weeks. Like, this is really clear what's happening here. And she's saying that not only are these two things not the same, but it is offensive and dangerous to draw a false equivalency here. This is the kind of, the kind of stuff you see someone replying to, like, you know, Kamala Harris's tweets. Like, this is, like, the, this is the stuff you kind of expect out of, like, the, the dumbest, like, you know, centrist, liberal Twitter account. This is... That kind of rhetoric coming from someone like AOC, I just do not get it. It is really clear that we are seeing you know, just a fundamental problem with the squad in general, and just in terms of how they use their power. They are continuously, continuously trying to play within the system, trying to play within the rules of yeah, we're moving. We're, we're making such great progress with electoralism. We need to focus on that even more. And what she's doing, like, she's she's raising all this money. She's, like, really garnering a bunch of support. What does she do with that money? She gives it $5,000 apiece to vulnerable House Democrats who all r- literally rush to give it back as soon as possible because they don't even want to be associated with her. Like, they, they can't even get the, the AOC stench off of their, you know, their bodies fast enough before they all, all lose in, like, the most pathetic campaigns possible. But, like, it is really, really... Um, kind of disturbing. Like I think like, there's no other point. There's no other way to to put it. Like this is di- not what you want to see at all. It's just not what you want to see from someone like AOC right now in terms of uh, challenging the Biden administration on things like immigration. Because this should, should this should be the the, the bread and butter of the situ like of uh, AOC's policy agenda. She's been so strong on that throughout the Trump administration, and she's called Biden out on some other stuff. I still like I'm not saying she has bad intentions, um, but this is just, you know, this this mindset is, I think, very, very dangerous and um, shows you like that. Talk about interpretation of or being open to and and uh, in taking, you know, a bad faith criticisms like criticizing Joe Biden is very privileged. Like that that is not the area where we want to be right now at all at all, folks. That is for sure. Girl, I must. We have a great number of exciting new announcements to come on the Spence Walsh Radio Network. Newsflash is to continue. Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, our flagship show is going to continue to give you the goods on the latest news stories the week told through a left-wing lens. And Uncultured is now being expanded. We are talking about everything pop culture related, whether it be sports, movies, music, books, Probably a lot of music still, though, to be quite honest with you. Kind of combining the concept of that's interesting from back in the spring to the music show Uncultured to uh, spruce it up and create a streamlined, simple, new culture department, I guess you could say, in Uncultured, the podcast for the Spencer Welsh Radio Network. And of course, Hidden History is coming back in the next two to three weeks. 
talking about some of the most under-discussed and most fascinating stories from modern history. That's what's going on in the Spence Watch Radio Network. But I do want to get to this very interesting uh, cl- uh, uh, analysis here from the Washington Post here about this Derek Chauvin trial. Um, yeah, so the footage... It's played multiple times inside the downtown Minneapolis courtroom where Derek Chauvin's on trial for murder, showing George Floyd, a black man, gasping for air under the white police officer's knee. That video is the centerpiece of the case against Chauvin, which prosecutors emphasized by urging jurors to believe their eyes. And that, I think, is a very kind of effective way to put it, because, you know, getting past all the legalese, all the 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 tripwires that are there to stop effective prosecution of police officers who do wrong things um, like that stricture, like you know that 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 advice. Believe your eyes. Believe what's happening in front of you. This is bad. Like I think that that is kind of <laughs> insane thing, thing that they uh, have to do that. But I really think that goes a long way. Uh, prosecutors face a pretty steep legal challenge of winning a conviction against a police officer. Despite nationwide protests, police are rarely charged when they kill someone on duty. And even when they are, winning convictions is often very difficult. Between 2005 and 2015, 1,400 officers were arrested for violence-related crime committed on duty, according to data contracted by Philip M. Stinson, a criminologist at Bowling Green State University. In 187 of those cases, victims were fatally injured in shootings, uh, or from other causes, the officers represent charge represent a fraction of the hundred thousand of people of police officers working for about eighteen thousand departments nationwide. Police charged with committing violent crimes while on duty were convicted more than half the time during that period. In most serious cases, those involving murder or manslaughter, the conviction rates were lower, hovering around. Um, 50%, just half the time. So, in comparison, about 6 in 10 people, just general people, charged with violent crimes were convicted, according to a federal report that examined cases adjudicated in the country's 75 most populous counties in 2009. The number increased to 70% when murder was the most serious charge. Most criminal cases in the United States end in plea bargains rather than court trials. So, yeah, about 56% of violent charges filed against police officers end in conviction. So, um... It is more, actually more often than not that you would see a uh, police officer kind of get convicted, but uh, this is just, again, with general violent charges, um, among murder or manslaughter charges, which are far far less frequent, actually getting that charge (laughs) is probably the toughest thing to do in the first place, getting a murder investigation. Once the charge actually happens, then it's then a lot easier to kind of go around. So a murder or manslaughter charges, though, still, it's, it's, it's not that easy because the conviction rate's only about half. Chauvin's case is different from many, uh, really, many of the most high-profile police prosecutions in recent memory, in part because it centers on an officer who never fired his gun, experts say. There are a few reasons why it's hard to convict a police officer, according to legal experts and attorneys who've worked on such trials. Police have considerable leeway to use force, can cite their training, and typically are trusted by juries and judges. The law favors the police, the law as it exists, David Harris, a law professor at the University of Pittsburgh and expert policing in policing, said. Most people, I think, believe that it's a slam dunk, Harris said of the case against Chauvin, but the reality of the law and the legal system is that it's just not. It's very unfortunate. Like, we... I, I, you... Almost with the with the George Floyd case, you kind of hope that, like the system has to step in and like for the general sake of just controlling, you know, our reality <laughs> that this guy just has to go to jail, like because of all the things of all the possibilities, um, like someone doing that, the world seeing it on on video and him getting no jail time, like this is ridiculous. Like we we cannot allow that to stand. Uh, and still continue to have any sort of like society with laws or police officers of any, of any kind. Um, but it is really, really tough to prosecute um, police officers. And it's it's very, like, there's a lot of different reasons why that is. Just the general bias, and, and the, not just the fact that, you know, uh, police violence is kind of in a large way, um, code of, and the accountability mechanisms are just not there. And the fact that police can do this with immunity has been through just precedent, and it, literal law itself has been very much codified into the into our justice system. 
Um, but attorneys who have worked both sides of these cases say they invite heightened security and raise a host of issues about the authority police have, the force they are allowed to use, and the dangers they could confront on the job. Which, by the way, police officers, people do not realize how like comparatively safe their jobs are to like a construction worker or something like that. Uh, it's fundamentally different than handling any other kind of cases. Neil J. Bruntrager, a St. Louis-based attorney who's represented officers in high-profile cases. We grant police very significant power, Bruntrager says, and when we see the prosecution of a police officer, police officer for a, law, a line of duty act, what we're really talking about is not the violation of the particular law, uh, whatever that may be, but the violation of trust. Uh, a key element of experts say factors in uh, that a key element that experts say factors into many cases of the Supreme Court's 1989 Graham v. Connor decision, which found that an officer's actions must be judged against what a reasonable officer would do in the same situation. So that's the kind of legal standard that they're setting up here. A police officer can use force, but it has to be justifiable, Brun Traeger says. And what the Supreme Court has told us is that we have to see this through the eyes of the police. And that's that system uh, kind of springing off, you know, the inherent you know, benefit of the doubt that police officers are given, whether right or wrong, um, as, you know, agent of the state to carry out the, the state's will, whatever that, that may be. Um, we have been, our, our legal system sees it through their perspective first and only. Police shoot, shoot and kill about 1,000 people a year, according to the Washington Post's database of tracking such cases. Most of these people are armed, and most of the shootings are deemed justifies. When people are charged with fatal shootings, officers are convicted less than half the time, often on lesser charges. Chauvin's case is unlike those in key ways, experts say. It'll be much harder for Chauvin to claim the usable justification of self-defense because, um, yeah, it's it's much harder because uh, to say that than when they're shooting deaths. Um, it's very hard for him to say, I was in fear for my life when I knelt on this man's neck. And we've seen people use that defense, you know, in less high profile cases and get away with it before in pretty ridiculous circumstances. But it's hard to say when the whole world's watching, he's going to pull that. Oh, yeah, I was afraid for my life here. Uh, when police shoot and kill someone, the officer's descriptions of what they saw and felt and accounts of the danger facing them or someone else can be major parts of the defense. Um and that's often the thing is that's often a lot of times where you know you don't have a full case on video, and the officer who, by the way, still has this huge amount of like I would argue completely unwarranted trust in the community can come out and say this guy was trying to attack me. He was he was going to kill me. I had to do something. You know, like the the kind of very classic like <laughs> like what we all think at this point. Um, when we think of, you know, a, a stereotypical, like, corrupt police officer being, oh, I had to do it. I had to get him. Come on. You know, it's almost like, <laughs> I almost like see it, in, I feel like I see it in TV shows almost as a joke at this point. Uh, kind of like a dark joke. But it is, like, all too easy for a police officer to do that and say, because of the way our justice system works, uh, that, oh, he, he, I was under attack. I was in, I was in threat for my life. Uh, but yeah, in many shooting cases, the officer will say, I perceived a threat in the form of reaching for a gun or an aggressive move towards me. And it's difficult for the state to disprove the perception of that threat because it's all about perception. That's all it takes. It's just a perception of a threat. Uh, in this case, Harmon said there's not the same ability to claim a perception of a threat because, you know, reasonably, you just can't. Chauvin's attorney argued the opening statement that the officer's charge in Floyd's death felt the growing crown at the scene was threatening, but Chauvin's court defense, as presented in legal filings and his attorney's remarks in court, appears focused on something else, making case that he didn't actually kill Floyd. In, court's, uh, in court filings, um, Chauvin's attorneys pointed to Floyd's health issues and saying that he most likely died of an opioid overdose, trying to break the chain of causation between Chauvin's knee and Floyd's death. That's pretty much the only way they can do it, but medical experts have said that they disagree with the defense's argument. That's probably going to be a big part of what we see in terms of uh, the, the trial and how that is um, that is very much a point of contention. That's probably what the whole trial really hinges on. Uh, debates over causation have come up in other cases not involving gunfire, including when people die behind bars or being stunned by tasers, says Craig B. Futterman, a University of Chicago law professor and director of Civil Rights and Police Accountability Project. Uh, in those cases, he said, an argument is often made that the other contributing factors, such as drugs in someone's system, played a role. The invocation of Floyd's drug use in the Chauvin trial also has previous echo chambers of cases in another ways. One of the standard strategies in the playbook that I've seen is when police officers are accused of misconduct um, are charged with killing someone is putting the victim and the victim's character on trial. So that looks 
like what people are trying to do here. It's a very good piece here in the Washington Post about why police are able to get away with things like murder and, you know, assault and doing all these awful things. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth um, a pretty interesting uh, an interesting look. And it's be interesting to see what happens if they can pull those levers in such an awful way in the Floyd case. All right. Let's move on now to talk about some UK politics. It's by Daniel Finn talking about one year of Keir Starmer's leadership. He writes, as Keir Starmer has approached the first year as labor leader, end of his first year as labor leader, there was a sullen mood in the camp. An editorial in the New Statesman, the would-be house journal of Starmerism, kind of very similar to, I would argue, like, you know, MSNBC or, you know, like, uh, not not the New York Times, but you know, a kind of standard soft left publication. The New Statesman is over there in the UK. They the would be House Journal of Starmerism has complained so far that his leadership was devoid of vision. The Labour Party seems to have lost confidence in what it was, what it wants, and for whom it speaks. Tom Cabassi, a enthusiastic supporter of Starmer's leadership campaign in 2020, delivered a scathing verdict on his record to date in February. The following year, according to Capacity, um, Starmer had provoked a completely un- unnecessary war with the party's left and launched a full frontal assault on labor membership that was equally avoidable. As Capacity observed, the Star- uh, Starmer's belligerence toward the labor left contrasted sharply with his willingness to go easy on the government rather than developing a clear message of his own. Enthrall to focus groups and short-term media hype, Starmer's leadership was already in sore need of a reboot before it celebrated its first birthday. If Starmer were to depart as a leader tomorrow, he would not leave a trace of meaningful political project in his wake. That's for damn sure. I mean, I don't think even his biggest supporters can uh, deny that. He's been saying, kind of going around uh, and being like, oh, we're going we're gonna to really take the mask off against the government. But yet. Yeah, We'll believe it when we see it. For those of you kind of coming into this situation with a little less of a background, pretty much just give you the the full background here. So Keir Starmer kind of comes in about a year ago after the very ten, uh, like you know, tense, um, you know, chaotic leadership, especially in the last two years of Jeremy Corbyn. They have incredible infighting among the party, a full on assault by the party's right on the Corbyn leadership that eventually leads to a crushing defeat in the general election. Then, obviously, Labour leads, needs a new leader. Starmer comes in a year ago as a unifier, someone who can pretty much um, tone down the you know the baggage and you know the, the left-wing habits of Corbyn that kind of got him so criticized, especially with regards to foreign policy, and pretty much come off as a you know, strong, country-loving guy who also you know, supports a little social democracy and really wants to build on and expand on the Corbyn project at home, uh, which probably would have been a pretty smart and sensible electoral policy that would have definitely created a more united Labour Party. But that is not what happened right off the bat. So Starmer comes in there, fills his cabinet with, you know, a mix of some left wing and some more centrist officials. Uh, but by and large, you know, the, even the most left wing officials, including the, the education secretary, who was the, you know, standard bearer to continue the Corbyn legacy, Rebecca Long Bailey. She was running for the leadership against Starmer. She kind of was a, as a unity pick, was put in the, the shadow cabinet, which is pretty much Starmer's top leadership team, as education secretary. And she was kicked out unceremoniously in June in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest because she shared an interview where a famous actor made a comment that was, you know, deemed in some way anti-Semitic, which I would argue that comment was not even anti-Semitic. So, um, yeah, she was fired for that. You know, slowly but surely, um, the 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 case and the evidence and the, the snubs Starmer tried to do against the left just began to build up until around October where I think Starmer committed probably one of his uh, most devastating acts of his leadership thus far that really caused a lot of the labor base to turn against him, which was kicking Jeremy Corbyn out of the Labor Party. Yes, he can do that as a leader. He can uh, revoke his membership to the Labor Party, which he has. He can't, he can't change the fact that he's a member of Parliament, but just an independent member of uh, Parliament at uh, Jeremy Corbyn is at the moment for, you know, relation to anti-Semitism. Pretty much Corbyn tried to defend himself. It's like, it's clear to see that this was a factional uh, anti-Semitism. Was, anti-Semitism was factionally abused for political gain. I mean, that's, I mean, by all accounts, 
objective accounts, and I'm not talking about a lot of what you may hear in the UK media. That is a fact. There was leaked reports that showed that um, the complaints process was manipulated in ways that were designed to make you know Corbyn supporters look bad and way more anti-Semitic, and people who had been accused of anti-Semitism that were more towards the center look better and have their cases go away quicker. It was a very, very sketchy situation where there's a lot of just uh, grubbiness with the kind of in internal party bureaucracy the Labour Party, which is it's, it's a whole thing to get into. But Corbyn was out of the party. Huge lack of trust among the party's base and activists that made the party so vibrant uh, when Corbyn, whenever Corbyn had success, was pretty much always because there was a huge army of people willing to knock on doors for him, willing to canvas for him, and that really were appreciative of his vision and goals. Um, he was really kind of had a rough approval rating with the rest of the public, but there were people who were willing to go to bat for him. And after that, all, whatever goodwill he had among the labor base changed. But about the general public, which is kind of what really matters, he wasn't doing that much well either. He, if you if you never heard him talk, probably have no idea what he, who he is or what he looks like. He's pretty much an incredibly stuffy, um, you know, metropolitan lawyer uh, who's not very charismatic. And is, uh, you know, kind of a he, he's been called by some people in the, you know, the British left media, a little bit of a wet wipe. He has been kind of uh, everyone was kind of praised him when he came in for his forensic opposition, which so far has uh, included him saying, we're going to get tough on the government. And then him just a few weeks later, when when people check up on that and saying, hey, where's that? Is that that opposition going to come in anytime soon? Are you going to are you going to challenge the government on anything? He was like, uh, wait, we were supposed to do that? And then just kind of recommits to doing that. And, you know, the whole cycle continues. And through that time, he's let a lot of key issues go by. From um, reopening schools to uh, the free school meals thing, uh, to, to which is a kind of program that they do in the UK to provide um, schools for kids. There's been a lot of opportunities where the government has just steamrolled ahead with very disastrous policies. And they've either been forced from outside pressure, whether it be, you know, in one case, uh, a, a soccer player or unions like they they've been forced to either make the right decision or they just let, let it go by and they abstain or they just take no action at all really what this has been and a year in Starmer is solidifying what it is his true project is it's not to go into number 10 downing street it's not to claim the premiership for the labor party no, it's about kicking out the left wing of the party. His campaign, his from the moment he got in there, his biggest phrase was the Labour Party was under new leadership. And that means kicking out the left. I mean, one year in, I think it's clear to say that with Starmer, his political goals begin and end with exterminating the left wing from the Labour Party and really nothing else. That is, uh, that's pretty much what we see so far with uh, Keir Starmer. And that is all the time we have for today. A fun little globe-trotting show. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. We'll probably have uh, Zach Lipschultz back on with us.